Sometimes I wonder what my dreams are. I feel like I have somewhat of a vision for my life, but the more and more I think about it, I kind of wonder like, what exactly are those dreams? Should your individual vision influence your communal vision? It does. It influences which communal vision you'll connect to because you're not going to connect to a communal vision that's smaller than your personal vision. If you're going to create a visionary environment, you have to have vision, which brings the clarity. You have optimism, which is the posture and hope, which is the fuel, it's the intrinsic that drives people. If I'm going to build a vision for my life, where do I start? I think you begin by you're listening to the Mind Shift Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Earl and Raphael McManus. Well, I'm not here with you. I'm actually in New York City. How are you doing? Doing good. We're doing a coast to coast today. Special edition of Mind Shift. <laughs> we are. We are. Which is good. It's nice. It's it's uh, a, a good friend of mine um, kind of gave me his place for the week, and it's been been a, a little bit of a just an exploration and just getting out of the city and having a few meetings and finishing up our collection and. Yeah, it's been nice. How how, how the last few days been been without me in LA? Um, peaceful. <laughs> no. no, but um, I am envious of any time anyone gets to be in New York. I love New York City. It's a great place to be. I love the the people, the that environment, everything about it. There's just something about the city, right? Like it, for, at least for me, it, it it gives me kind of hope to just be more creative and to to have new ideas. And yeah, I mean. I used to live here 10 years ago and then haven't really spent so much time here. But, you know, we come often or from time to time. So it, it's been nice to kind of have, I think I've been here maybe for almost a week. It's been nice to have that time and just wander around, find new spots, run into old friends. Um, yeah, explore new things. And, and we work with a great team out here that has an amazing factory. But I do think, I do think a mosaic should be in New York. There should be a mosaic in New York. Oh, I've always thought that. I mean, there's just so much of New York that resonates with me. And, and you know, it's, it's in my in, um, history. I lived in Queens when I was a little kid. So I've got some New York roots in me. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great place. Okay. So here's, here's, here are my thoughts. You know, I, I've been having this conversation with myself, this internal monologue. And we've been, you know, we've been, we've been talking about where do we want to take the podcast and with these episodes. And, you know, some weeks... We have really exciting things that happen. And some weeks we have like reflective things that happen. And, and I've noticed that the last few clips, the last few episodes have been a lot about like self-love and self-worth and this kind of ideas. And so I, I got to thinking and I, I was, I'm reading your book, your new book. We should actually talk about that at the top of the hour. Can we get into that real quick? Sure. So I'm, I'm carrying around. Oh, it's, it's in, it's in the But other. I have a way of talking about it inside of the topic you want to talk about. So you want me to, we're going to tease the book. Yes. Which by the way, we, 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 we have a, uh, what is it? Like a sample cover. The temporary oh, yeah, we cover. Do. It got sent over to GLS. So we're good. And if everyone listening, GLS is Global Leadership Summit. Uh, they'll have somewhere between 200,000 to 350,000 people around the world attend their conference, which is pretty amazing. And we're launching the book at that event, August 8th. August 8th in Chicago. If you're anywhere in the world and you can get there, you should get there. They are great people. It's an amazing conference. Uh, what is it? Two or three days. And it's like 18 to 20,000 people just in Chicago. And then they satellite it all over the world to all these massive locations. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty amazing. Okay. So I, I won't say the name of your book. I'll let you do that. But been reading your book, been highlighting, underlining, kind of just writing my notes. It's been really exciting. It's kind of been cool to be in a new place. I feel like I'm a college kid again with my big old, you know, it's in this big binder and I have all my notes written down with my highlighter. And yeah, it's been fun. Okay. So I've been walking around and I was thinking about this idea. Sometimes I'm always, sometimes I wonder what my dreams are. I've never been the guy that's had, you know, I want to be in Paris Fashion Week by 2025. I, I, I've never been the guy who's like, I want to grow something to the place where, you know, we hit a $10 million mark, $100 million mark in 18 months. I've just never been that guy. I've had dreams. There are things I'm interested in. I have, I feel like I have somewhat of a vision for my life, but the more and more I think about it, I kind of wonder like, what exactly are those dreams? What dreams do I have? What visions do I see? And where do I want to go for the future? So much of my life, I've connected myself with really interesting people that have taken me to interesting places. 
So the topic today is how to have vision for your life. Because vision's essential, right? Essential for the betterment of our lives, for the collective improvement of society. And we oftentimes, and I know that I do, feel lost when I feel like I cannot grab onto a healthy vision. There's a lot of us out there, I think, that rely on other people to give us vision. Right? Yeah. They, no. We do. So and, I, yeah. I was going to say, and e even, um, you know, the, the Old Testament, you know, from Jewish wisdom, it says, without vision, the people perish. So thousands of years ago, there was an awareness that there's an inherent need for vision. And I think because we are a part of a very individualistic culture, we think everyone needs to have a personal vision all the time rather than a communal vision. And we think the vision has to emerge from us rather than sometimes come to us. And so I think sometimes we put a heavy burden on ourselves to go, I need to always have, quote, a personal vision for my life rather than a vision that's compelling enough to give my life to. Right. And so if you look at like those great movements in history, you know, the, the forming of this nation, right? It wasn't that, you know, maybe each one of them, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, you know, Franklin, uh, it wasn't that they all had a personal vision. They all had a a corporate vision of creating this new uh, nation. And so the, the vision was bigger in a sense than them. And, you, you know, you have, um, you know, great teams, you know, you have, now you have the, the Celtics against the Mavs and the NBA finals. And um, each person could have a vision for their life, right? But the team that's going to win is really the team that has a team vision, the, the one that has a communal vision. So I think sometimes we overemphasize our personal vision and underestimate um, a communal vision, a vision that's so powerful, so big, so compelling that we give our life to it as well. Yeah, I was actually listening to this clip today that it was, uh, it was uh, uh, what is his name? Is it, is it um, Maximus and Gladiator? It's Russell Crowe talking to, oh, what is his name? He plays the, the emperor who he is, is it Harris? Uh, Rich, is it Richard Harris? Richard Harris, I believe. I think it was Richard Harris. And he, he, they, they talk about R Rome at one point was just a dream and a vision that you, ha you could only whisper about its reality. And I thought that such an interesting thing, right? Because I, I was looking at different things and like how visions have been executed in the past. And I wanted to bring up this idea. I think you bring up a phenomenal idea of individual vision versus communal vision. I think we should dive into that deeper. But this this there's different ways of having vision or being a part of vision. And I think you have vision in your marriage, you have vision in your relationships, you have vision in your business. And oftentimes in that, within that vision, there are goals that you would like to achieve in those common spaces. So I think that's a conversation around individual vision versus communal vision. But I, I was looking up something. Uh, do you remember the old Got Milk campaign? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, okay. 1993, the milk industry launched its most awarded campaign called Got Milk, a question society would ask itself for the next 20 years. And I was kind of diving into it a little bit because I grew up with Got Milk. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was in all like the scholastic newsletters that you would get in school. And it was, it was on TV. It was on billboards. This idea of Got Milk. And I was, I was, I was d diving deeper. And it, it talked about how milk, uh, milk sales were declining like the late 80s, early 90s. So the California milk industry came together and decided to like appoint a marketing council to figure out how to incite people to buy more milk. And I thought it was really unique because I'm like, okay, this is a team that's going, we have to come together, have collective vision to achieve something that's kind of remarkable. They created one of the most highly awarded and well-remembered uh, marketing campaigns that have ever existed. So I think there's really interesting, you know, simple visions when you got to solve a problem, but then how do you have, how do you navigate and know how to have a healthy vision versus an unhealthy vision? That's an interesting question because when you talk about the God milk, I start, immediately my mind goes, it, it changed the question. You don't even ask the question, do you need milk? <laughs> you know, and uh, it, 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 it makes all these assumptions and, um, which is very interesting because if I remember the commercials, the commercials made you feel that you could not become the optimal version of you without milk. So 
actually, this is an interesting and important, I think, nuance. The commercials were not about convincing you how great milk was. The campaign was about convincing you how great you would be if you drank milk. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's part of the nuance of having um, a, a vision that works. Uh, one, I would say, because um, you said you have dreams and visions, I think sometimes a dream is something you hope happens in your life, but a vision is something you're committed to make happen in your life. So I would nuance a difference there. You know, I've had different dreams, uh, but there were just things I kind of hoped would happen. When I had a vision, it was something I felt compelled to make happen. And, and then I think there's a difference between, let's say, a, a vision and a goal. And I started thinking about even with my next book, uh, The Seven Frequencies of Communication. Like, let's say a, a goal would be, I'm going to sell a million copies of this book. That would be a goal. But a vision would be, I'm going to transform the way that human beings interact with each other through their understanding of human communication frequencies. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to change the way the world interacts with each other. And, and I think sometimes when we're super pragmatic, we just have goals, but we don't really have a vision. And then we wonder why, especially in a company, why our teams and employees aren't passionate. I don't think people are one passionately to goals. I think people are one passionately to vision. And so when you have a, a, a corporate, a communal, even a personal vision, it changes the way that you interact with it. I, I was thinking about how, um, like the cell phone, you know, early on, if you're thinking, um, a goal would be, we're going to put a phone in the hands of, you know, a million people or 10 million people or 100 million people. And a vision would be, we're going to connect the whole world to each other by putting a smartphone in their hand. I think a vision is a, a compelling um, perspective of a new future that, you're, that you want to create and hopefully create together. I mean, the cell phone is such a great example, right? Something yep. that really does not need to be marketed very much. Even though you see AT&T ads, Verizon ads, what is it? Like what's, I remember the Boost team, like mobile or like the Boost mobile ads with like the walkie talkies and all of these different forms of marketing for the cell phone. But really, it was almost one of those things that I think would have happened so naturally because humans want to communicate constantly, right? You're giving people the ability to cut the cord, walk out the house, Go onto the street and still be able to call your best friend, to still be able to call your lover, the person you're in love with. Like the world changed when you were able to, you know, go from um, AOL Instant Messenger to being able to text your friend and be out in the wild, right? And so humans have this desire to communicate, whether it's communicate in depth or communicate on the most shallow level. Like how often do we send each other DMs? and messages, just sending each other funny things, or, hey, I saw this clip, or this sports highlight, or, you know, controversy, or politics, we're always sending to each, each other things. And I kind of, and we, you know, we'll talk about that, because I remember an era where I was, you know, three, four, five years old, yeah, I think my first cell phone I got when I was 15, and I remember, I remember it was like, this is for you, this is only for you to call me and mom. No one else. I don't want you running up the phone bill. You know what I mean? And at one point, you were charged for how many text messages you sent. That's how right. How many minutes you sent on the phone. And so, you know, pre that, I do remember growing up, waiting by the phone, waiting for the call when you were traveling. Oh, I get to talk to dad for a few minutes. And, you know, or you'd call collect or, you know, there was just all of these funny ways of communicating. Okay, so I want to bring up what you talked about communal vision versus individual vision. If you find, I find that when I'm in my least healthy space in life, I'm too focused on my individual vision versus the communal vision that I can be a part of. But then there's other moments where, you know, whether I'm leading a team or a company or a business, um, I have to create the communal vision. So does that play hand in hand? Should your individual vision influence your communal vision? It does. And, and it influences which communal vision you'll connect to because you're not going to connect to a communal vision that's smaller than your personal vision. And because then your personal vision would have to get smaller and smaller. And, and I think it's actually why so many people find themselves frustrated 
that they can't get people to buy in. And it's because what they're trying to promote as a corporate vision is so much smaller than people's individual personal visions that it isn't compelling at all. It's interesting that Webster's definition of vision is the power of seeing. And I, I think one of the nuances to me of vision, and I'm going to say this and we can all argue about it. <clears throat> Maybe you can argue in the comments, right? It's impossible to have vision in its purest form without optimism. Now, you can have, quote, if you want to distort the word, a vision of a negative future. But that's not what the word vision really means. You know, and um, if you do not have optimism, you cannot have vision because you do not believe that you can get better, that your life can get better, that the world can get better. And, and this is why optimistic people are the ones that create the future. They, they violate all the percentages. What seems impossible becomes possible for them. What everyone thought was out of reach actually becomes within everyone's reach. The power of a vision is that it's, it's carrying forward human optimism to create a better world, a better future. It really is an interesting thought. I, I, as I've been walking and talking and, you know, I, I called you the other night because I was walking home and I had, I had walked some friends back to their place and was walking back to mine. There's something beautiful about that in New York, right? You get these long 30 minute hour walks where you get to just be by yourself and your thoughts and really process the day or the future and kind of have these conversations. And I was asking myself, where do I want to go? And, and or where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Am I just coasting? Am I just, you know, living my life? Am, you know, how, am I moving forward? Am I bringing progress? We talk a lot about these three human intrinsics of intimacy, meaning, and destiny, which we also call progress. And, you know, I, I think I struggle with intimacy. I value meaning. And progress is something I desire so much, but I oftentimes can't see how to achieve forward motion. And so, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, wherever I go, I have to go to places where hope lives. That how important this idea, you talked about optimism, but I want to talk about hope. Like how important it is to not just, to, I think it goes hand in hand, how to be optimistic and to have hope, but how to see things and to provide things for other people going, there's something inspirational in this world, whether it's other humans, whether it's other stories, whether it's impactful realities or moments where you get to be generous, but hope and bringing hope to other people, I think has this long lasting effect. So I don't know if that's directly connected to vision, but I do think that vision has, has to have hope. Yeah, I think you just hit the triangle right there. Vision, optimism, and hope. That if you're going to create a visionary environment, you have to have vision, which brings the clarity. You have optimism, which is the posture and hope, which is the fuel, it's the intrinsic that drives people. And many times um, people will be drawn to a vision simply because they find hope of a better future and a better world. And it, it's, it's very, very powerful because optimism is, is almost like a mental framework. Um, you just believe. It's funny because optimistic people do not fail less. They're just less affected by failure. <laughs> and, uh, but Hope is the driving core human intrinsic. Hope is what fuels it all. And when you, and interesting, like you can't be depressed when you're hopeful. And you actually move toward depression when you lose your, your vision for your future, your optimism that you can get there, and the hope that fuels you. And, and so I, I think one of, the, one of the great maybe resets for all of us, when we start feeling discouraged or depressed, and is, okay, I need to go back and find my hope. I need to begin to frame my view of myself and my life from optimism, and I need to clarify the vision of where I'm going. That's so good. That's so, so good. Okay, so let's, let's start off like 101. Let's start off 101. If I'm going to build a vision for my life, where do I start? I think you begin by assessing who you are and where you are, who you want to become and where you want to go. It's, it's, it's a self-awareness assessment. Who am I right now? And who do I want to become? And then where am I right now? 
and where do I want to go? And then you have to go, and what are the actions, the choices, the structures that I need to get from here to here? Mm, I like that. Yeah, no. So it's just, you know, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to realize, ah, I'm not who I used to be. So I've made progress, but I'm not who I want to be. So I feel discouraged. But do we ever fully live in a satisfied being of self? Like, do we ever, do we ever just go, who I am is exactly who I need to be? You, you know, I, I think that you can find a place where you feel, you feel content, not satisfied, but content. And um, without ego, but with a deep sense of gratitude. And, and, and so I don't want to say that that sense of fullness and wholeness is unattainable. Because even when my life isn't working out the way I want it to, and even when I fail, and even when I um, fall short of my own expectations of me, I actually do have a sense of contentment of, um, I like the person I've chosen to become. And I like the person I'm becoming. And I understand that the shortcomings and the gaps between those um, are just a part of the process. So that I don't feel judged by them. I feel awakened by them. Where I fall short, I don't feel judgment anymore. I just feel awakened going, oh, I have so much more room for growth. That's the next part of the journey for me. Yeah. I mean, it's the idea of looking at a glass half full versus half empty. Right. Um, no, but I think vision is so important. And we were talking about this the other day. You, you had said something. You were like, I need to reestablish the vision that we have for a specific thing. I was like, oh, I think so. You know, and I, and I think that, that I want to ask that as my next question. How often do you have to refill and renew vision? And how often do you have to remind people and yourself of that vision? I would say it depends on the person. I think people are psychologically structured to carry different levels of vision. And I know it sounds crazy. I, I, I think probably 50, 60% of the population um, actually find incredible satisfaction and fulfillment with short-term vision. I just want to know, know what I need to do today or this week or this month. Me. <laughs> and, that is um, me. And I, you know, it's, it's, if I were to use the, 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 the teachings of Jesus, I would go, this is the prayer. Give me, give me this day of my daily bread. There's some people, the vision they are most comfortable with is the daily assignment of life. Don't, don't talk to me about changing the world. Don't talk to me about 20 years from now. You're just wasting it on me. And, and so there are some people who are more, I think, structured to be logistical. And then there's some people, and I'd say maybe 20, 30% of the population are more tactical. Uh, they would get bored by day to day, but they get overwhelmed by two years and beyond. They're more the 30 day to six month kind of tactical uh, visionaries. I just want to know what's the next great challenge? What's the next great project? What's the next great task? And, and that vision is a different container. And then there are maybe 5% of people that I would call to be like pure visionaries. They're the two years and beyond person. They're the person that plans from the end of time back to the present. And they may not ever make it back to the present because they're living in the future the whole time. And that person needs to always see the interconnection between what they're doing and their vision of humanity, of reality, of their life. But I think that that need is smaller than we think. And, and so how often do you need your vision renewed? Ironically, it's based on where you fall on that because if you're a person who wants, who needs a daily kind of weekly vision, you might need to have it renewed constantly. It's just, it's not so far in the future. It's just for this moment right now. If you're a tactical person, then you might need a, like a vision update, a vision recharge every 30 days. You know, and uh, or at the furthest every six months, and there's some people. There's such long-term visionaries that you you share vision with them, and they, they're compelled by it, and it fuels them for life because vision is actually coming emerging out of them more than um, being absorbed by them. 
could you give me a couple of examples? Not give me a couple of examples. I don't need examples of this because I think I've experienced this. And I think most people have experienced to some degree the, the level of unhealthy vision you can have. Or when healthy vision gets um, destroyed by unhealthy people. You know, there was, there's a, I, I had called you yesterday because something had bothered me. And I was just kind of, I oftentimes call you when I want to regulate my thoughts or emotions or, you know, just keep perspective, right? And where I don't want it to like leak and I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want to call someone on our team to, to you know, whether it's out of fear of being looking insecure or angry or bitter. But you know, I, I've been a part of things that, that we, we both, we both have been a part of organizations that haven't worked well, you know, or we've been a part, even in Mosaic, there's been, there's been season Mosaic. I think this is the, the beautiful reality is that even Mosaic, which I think is the most wonderful place. There are people in every, every like, um, what is it like segment or generation of Mosaic that some people like it. Some people don't. There's, there's always going to be people who love the vision and there's always going to be people who don't know what the vision is. There's always going to be people who get frustrated with the vision or get frustrated with the leaders. And how do you be a healthy contributor to communal vision? Yeah. One, you don't want to mistake people loving and experience with loving your vision. Because especially when dealing with something like, um, like Mosaic, you, you know, they, they may love the experience, but they may not have any idea what the vision is. You know, and it, it, and if you could just put this in a different domain, it's sort of like a um, a sports fan that they love when you win, hate when you lose, and but um, but then there are others who are committed to the team and they are committed to the process of moving toward greatness. And uh, you know, one of the things I loved, I mean, absolutely loved. Well, I think it was the um, the end of the Pacers Celtic series. The Pacers lost at home. I think it was. And the fans, no, no, it was uh, maybe it was the Timberwolves. I can't remember which one it was, but one of the two teams that lost, the fans were cheering them on, and celebrating them. And I thought, ah, oh, here it is. But it was what it was. It was the Knicks. I it can't might remember have been the as well, but it was the Knicks. They they got like a standing ovation. Yeah, from their, I, their fans. I I was like I I was. Uh, emotionally affected by that because I thought here are fans who are committed to the vision of the team, not the experience of the team. Because when you're committed to the experience, you only, I mean, frankly, one of the reasons I have a hard time with Laker fans is like, man, they're, they're the most fickle fans in the world. They'll boo the Lakers off the court. They'll hate the players. You know, they'll, they'll I mean, they hated Pau Gasol when, you know, when they felt he was to blame for Kobe's demise. And, and you, to me, when you have fans who celebrate you when you win and boo you when you lose, they're committed to the experience you're giving them. And, uh, and that's true in a business. It's true in a company. There are people who are committed to the experience you give them rather than the vision you've called them into. And then there's some people who are committed to the vision, and they're the people that stay with you when the experience is not... Uh, worth staying for. They're the ones that stay through the hard times. They're the ones who stay through the struggle. Because they're committed to the vision. I think that's something that's very revealing about the individual, even ourselves, right? Because I hate the Clippers, but I love the Clippers. But the Clippers are mine to hate because I've chosen them, whether they've chosen me or not. I will always, I will never be a Lakers fan. And I am usually a Clippers fan. But this last couple of seasons, I, you know, I, I told you, I was like, I've broken up with them. I still love them. I would go back to them if they, if they, if they do the right things. But I need to watch the way that they operate. <laughs> I think there's something so revealing in us, right? Because we're able to be loyal and committed when things are great. And, and there's always those fanatics who, who hype up the things that are, that are good in the moment. And the moment things struggle, the moment things have go through weaknesses or, you know, then, then they start getting overtly critical. And I, I wonder if that's how we look at ourselves sometimes, not to yeah. make this totally internal, but where we, we feel good. And I know I'm like this. I feel good about myself and I feel like I'm winning. I feel good about myself and I feel like I'm with people and have community and have great relationships or we're doing really well. And then 
I fall apart when I feel like I'm a little lonely or I'm a little depressed or I maybe something isn't going the way I want it to go or I can't find someone to be, you know, I'm a 35 unmarried man. Like there's, there's, there's things there that I have to wrestle with and, and work on. And then I get really hard on myself. So I'm like, I, you're the only, I, what? You're the worst Aaron's fan. <laughs> the worst. I treat Aaron like I treat the Clippers. <laughs> because you you know you're you're really you cheer yourself on when you're doing great and then when you feel like you're not meeting the standard for yourself you you know you start booing the team <laughs> and uh, which by the way is how you can if you want to know where you fall on that spectrum if you're listening it's how much external um criticism affects you because external criticism affects you when you're a horrible critic of yourself and you already feel these things about yourself. So now you feel like they're just validating what you already hate about yourself. And that's why it's so important to find a sense of wholeness and relationship to yourself that you cheer yourself on when you're losing, <laughs> that, you know, you believe in yourself when you're failing. And because there'll be times where if, um, if you let other people decide your worth There'll be no one cheering for you in your down moments when you need it the most, not even you. And in the, in the moments where you're down and no one's for you, that's when you need to be the one who believes in yourself. And it's that's cheering yourself on to pull through. That's why a vision for your life is so essential. So essential. You need to first decide who you're going to become regardless of the opinion of other people. And that is the most powerful vision you can have for your life. My favorite visionary moment in human history is when Jesus looks at a multitude of throwaway human beings and he says to them, you are the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. He doesn't tell them what they're going to accomplish. He tells them their value, their essence. You are the light of the world. Now you may choose not to light it up, but let me tell you who you are. You're the salt of the earth. People may tell you you're the dust or the dirt of the earth. I'm telling you the salt. To me, that's, that's the greatest example of vision casting in human history. When you look into a human being and you call out the value and greatness in them. And when you can actually let that go deep into you and go, um, the most important thing in my life is a vision for my life. That's the vision for me is more important than the vision of what I will accomplish. What kind of person do I want to be at the end of my life? Pursue that person. That's the most powerful vision in your life. You know, Neil Dingra, who's a good friend of ours or becoming a good friend of ours. He is actually a great person to follow on, follow on Instagram. His, his Instagram account is Neil Home. And you, if you know us, we barely ever do that. But he always posts really interesting stories. And he, he posted um, what people think success is. He says, making a ton of money. There's like two categories. And then he says, what success actually is, having purpose, being a good person, taking care of your family, making an impact, owning your time. And I thought it was really interesting because Neil's pretty successful. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he also is just, he, happy birthday, Neil. It's his, it was his birthday last week. And it was really cool because we, one of our guys, Dan Bolton, got really sick and he was supposed to do an arena summit with us, which is our once a month online free event that we do. And we invite some of your great friends and some of my new friends. Um, and we kind of break down for an hour, two hours, whether it's business, entrepreneurship, podcasting, content creation. This last time was building your, building your personal brand. And then Dan texted us last minute, which poor, like this guy is not, he's a great communicator. He's always communicating. You know, we were checking in all week and he had kind of told me he wasn't feeling too good, but it was like, you know, I'll be fine. This is Zoom. We're going to be okay. But he lives in Bali and he got dengue fever. And so <laughs> yeah. me and you woke up, I had just landed in New York. I landed in New York at like 1.30 in the morning, got to this place at 2.30 in the morning. And then I woke up around six. And wake up to a text from him being like, hey, bro, I, I'm waiting on blood results, blood test. I have dengue fever. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Like I'm having a hard time staying con conscious or something, you know. And then we, we, you texted one of our friends, Neil, and he jumped on. And luckily, he's, he's an expert at building your personal brand and how to build your content online. And, and so that was really, really a unique case. But I, I do find that interesting, right? Because we sometimes, uh, we, sometimes we have the worst compass. 
for wh where we should be going and the values that we should align ourselves with? What are some personal values or characteristics that you've always kind of have been core values for you in your life? Yeah, I, I um, for me, one of the, my driving core values is that I'm the same person in every room that I actually have integrity. And, I, and, and it's a little ethereal when you say, I, I, I want to be my true self all the time and comfortable with that, regardless of whether it gets me accepted or rejected. I just want to be my true self. And I think I, I just feel like so many people spend their energy with, with developing personas or becoming who other people want them to be. And, and I, I felt that when, especially when I was younger and occasionally even still where you just feel so insecure or, you know, you're in the wrong room or, you, you, you know, you you just feel like you're in a deficit and all of a sudden you're using all your energy to try to figure out who people want you to be so you can be accepted. And so I think one of the, my driving values in my life is I just want to be my true self, an authentic expression of me. But I also have another one. And I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I have a very, you know, hardcore driving value of kindness. And that I, uh, because I'm an entrepreneur, because I'm a leader, and because I, you know, um, have massive responsibility for people and people work for me. and um, I know I have to do hard things and I know that I have to make tough decisions. And so I have a deep commitment that people who, if you have more power, you have more responsibility to be kind. And, and so I've just always tried to um, use power as a source for kindness rather than a source for fear. And that, that's been a really a driving theme in my life. And I think a third one, if I could just pick one more, is I think I have, uh, I, I, I've always had a driving conviction, core value of pursuing truth, um, no matter what. That um, I would never hold on to my beliefs when they were violated by truth. That I think there are people who their beliefs are more important to them than truth. And, and it's a weird thing to say as a person who believes in Jesus and a person who has deep faith. Um, but I would never put my beliefs above my pursuit of truth. And uh, because I, I explain that because I think there's some people out there going to have a hard time with that statement. What do you? Yeah, mean? I, I don't believe that I found a belief outside of pursuit of the truth. I think there are a lot of people who are afraid of science. A lot of people are afraid of like biology. A lot of people who are afraid um, of anthropology because they think it's going to violate their, their faith, their belief system. And I actually love every discipline. I love science. I love biology. I love anthropology. I, you know, I, 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 I love it all because I'm not afraid of discovering something that will violate my belief system. Because if, if I came to discover that something I believed wasn't accurate, I would elevate my beliefs and thinking instantly. And, um, I really, I, I, I'll never forget the words that Dallas Willard said, the one chance I had to go and be in a room with him and this brilliant thinker. And he said something that shook me and stayed with me the rest of my life. He said, um, Jesus would pursue truth wherever it led him. And when he said that, it was just this powerful reconfirmation in my soul of this is why I'm a follower of Jesus. And this is why I trust that faith is that I'm given permission in a sense to pursue truth wherever it leads me. I don't have to hide from truth. I don't have to hide from uncertainty and, uh, and I don't have to be afraid of mystery. Um, so, so that's a huge part of it. And I think a lot of my writing and a lot of my teaching, um, a lot of my thinking, the reason that they've been valuable and helpful to people is that I'm not afraid of the nuances because I'm not trying to protect my faith or my belief system. Um, I'm not trying to protect something that is mine. <laughs> this is what I believe. And uh, I'm actually trying to pursue something that's bigger than me. This is what's worth believing. <laughs> hmm. That's good.
you know, I, I do sometimes struggle with you. We talk about like the, your own identity and your own vision for yourself and you have to remember who you are. And that's some, you know, one of the things that I find most important in building culture with teams, companies, organizations, churches, whatever it may be, even this podcast is reminding yourself who you are. You have to do it. We have to do it more often than we think, right? It's why so many of these come, you know, it's why Nike has just do it. It has these companies that have strong characteristics or you know subtitles sub brands uh, marketing slogans but it's a, it's a statement to live by this idea of like who we are and i remember before i would go to bed every night growing up you would always pray this prayer with me and you'd sit down and you'd say buddy i want you to you know what are the three things that we live by you know, to, to be known by love to live by faith and to be a voice of hope and i would say faith's hard sometimes Sometimes I'm holding on to these bars, getting dragged around a roller coaster without a seatbelt, hoping to God I don't fall off, right? Faith is where sometimes I lack. And, and what, one of the three, I can always be lacking. I have to always be growing. But faith is one of those things where sometimes, sometimes my faith is deeper than my understanding, right? That even in the moments where I go, I don't really understand you, God, because you say you created me in the image of you, yet I can't see you, yet there are moments where I feel you, your presence, but I'm not sure... And, you know, and I, this is another conversation for another time, but, but, you know, but then there's moments where I'm like, I have no hope. So how am I supposed to live by hope and be, and, you know, uh, to be known by love, to be a voice of hope and, and to live by faith. Like how am I supposed to be a voice of hope if I have none, <laughs> you know? All right. and so it, no, go. No, no. I'm going to just, because I think you're speaking for a lot of people. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just want to remind you, and I know we've talked about this before. Um, one of the, I think one of the most powerfully simple books that I've read is called Learned Optimism by Martin Sligman. And, and he basically talks about optimistic people relate to failure different than pessimistic people. And it's so simple. And uh, optimistic people do not see failure as personal, permanent, or pervasive. People who struggle with depression, people who become pessimistic, they see failure as personal. I am a failure. It's permanent. This failure is my life. And it's pervasive. I failed at everything. And it's this third one that I want to address real quickly, Aaron. When you feel like you're sinking, and if you're listening, like whenever you feel like you're sinking, you're just losing that optimism and you're getting more depressed. You're seeing everything your life is missing. What's happening is you're allowing a pervasive view of failure to take over your brain. And you, you know, you ever seen those movies where, you know, the, the guy falls off the cliff and he just throws that, you know, that whatever that spike and he sticks it on the wall and he saves his life and he's hanging there. All right, this is how you do it. You're, you're going, ah, you're going down into you know, the cliff of despair. You got to throw that spike. Find one thing in your life that's good. Just one. And just place your stake there and focus on that. And what that does is it brings light to this darkness that your life is pervasively bad. And the moment you find that one your brain goes, okay, if there's one good thing, there might be two. Put the second stake there. And then find the third. And before you know it, you're going to be climbing back up and you're going to find yourself filled with optimism and hope again. Yeah. No, I think it's really fascinating. I think, I think that's where vision is so important in all of this, right? Like to do those things, to live by faith, be known by love, be a voice of hope, do any of those things well. You do have to have a sort of understanding, one, of who you are, but two, of where you're going. And is there room where you're going for other people? You know, why are you laughing? No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. But anyways, I think this is a great conversation. I don't feel like we have to go too, too much longer, but I just wanted to talk about this idea of having vision for your life. I, yeah. I, and again, it's like, um, you don't have to start with a vision, you know, of, that matches like, you know, Steve Jobs, I'm going to start this or, you know, you know, or Bill Gates, I'm going to, you know, create this. I think a great place to start is where would you like to see your life elevate even just incrementally from where it is right now? Like, so, you know, vision to me is a muscle. And if you've never done a push up, don't try to do a hundred. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, just work on one push up and go, okay, I want to develop a vision for my health. I, I want to develop a vision for my mornings. You know, I want to develop a vision for my relationships. But that's the interesting thing, right? Like with, I listened to an interview with Goggins and people might be rolling their eyes, but Goggins, Goggins is a fascinating creature to me. He's, he is, he is, he is built from some steel, you know, but he, he, I think he, it was actually not Goggins. It was, it was a friend of his who said, I had never really worked out. I was so out of shape and I needed to change my life. And so Goggins moved in with him and his wife, I think, or maybe this guy moved in with, with Goggins. I've heard a few stories of this, but he basically said, we're going to do a hundred push, a hundred pull-ups. And he goes, I can't, don't think I can do one pull-up. And he goes, okay, well, you can do one pull-up a hundred times. <laughs> and he goes, I just sat there for hours and he would do one. Okay, cool. Now get down. Okay. Now go do another one. Do one. Okay, get down. And so there is this relationship between like discipline and time and your ability to stay committed to seeing through the things that you, 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 you need to achieve. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was having, um, uh, coffee with, um, a guy named Todd, who's the founder of Stark. Stark Life is a, uh, is like a, high end high level fitness community and and he said to me he said um when it was really sweet he's like i'm really committed to your health and we really want to help you get to whatever level of optimal performance you want to get to and he said but he goes i think that you know the way you think you want to do everything in three months you want to do everything in six months max and he said you're 65 he said you can have a four pack by the time you're 70 if you give yourself five years and and then we and and I went, oh, I love that, I, you know. And uh, five years, I thought, oh, that'd be pretty cool to have a four pack in five years. And before he left, I could tell he he repented a little bit. He goes, he said, I I I mean, I don't want to underestimate you. You could have a six pack. <laughs> I love I love Todd. Todd's, Todd's Todd's an enigma to me. I really love running into him. And and but but really was what he was doing is he was. He was setting inside of my brain a vision for my future if I wanted it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the power of a vision is that you begin to see yourself differently. You see your life differently. You see the future differently. You see the world differently. And then it becomes so compelling that you create the strategy, which is the infrastructure, to turn that vision into reality. Yeah, not to be too cheesy, but it feels like casting vision for other people and even yourselves. It's like planting seeds. Yeah. And going, okay, I, I can't expect to harvest anything or to seek growth in my life if I don't start with just little seeds. Like, okay, you know what? I struggle mentally. I'm going to get some help. I'm going to read some books on mental health, go to a therapist, I plant these seeds. You know what I mean? I always laugh because I, I, I do try to challenge people in my life to go to therapy and not from a high and mighty way. Sometimes it feels self righteous, but I'm like, you will discover so much about yourself in three hours, in three sessions, three 50 minute sessions. You will go from a roller coaster of, wow, I'm garbage to, oh, there's hope to, oh, there's no hope to, oh, I got to, you know, like you, it's this incredible source of impending doom and great uh, potential of the future, you know? And, and, and so I think it is important to plant seeds in your own life and to plant seeds in the image of who you are, to plant seeds in, other people and to show people where where we can go together if we stay committed to the vision i love that well we probably should pick this up um and maybe even get some questions about vision and and um and so we could dive into this in a more um, tactile way no i would love that i love that hey guys thank you so much for joining us for this episode of mind shift uh a couple of things this podcast is rooted in a book a book that my dad, Erwin Raphael McManus, wrote this last year, and and it is one of my favorite books. I'm actually about to go to a coffee in a little bit. We're about to do an arena session with our with our arena crew. If you don't know what the arena is, go to thearenasummit.com and check out the arena. It's our online community. And also, if you haven't picked up MindShift, pick up MindShift. But I'm going to a coffee, Dad, with an architect um, in in two hours after our arena call, and I'm I bringing them a mind a copy of MindShift. I don't go anywhere without it. So that's awesome. Really I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, guys, we will see you next week and we cannot wait to come back. See you soon.